turnout. That's wonderful to see. I see uh, a lot of faces that I recognize and a lot that I don't. I didn't want to give a special welcome to those people that are, are new to um, our chapter or new to our, um, uh, you know, coming to these, uh, these meetings online and welcome and I hope we see you again. Um, to, really, I'm going to dispense with kind of all the announcements except for a couple things. We're going to have uh, Skip Morris next month in February, the second Wednesday of the month. Skip has written, I think, 18 books on fly fishing and fly tying, and he's going to do um, probably something on nymphing, but um, uh, I don't know. I'm gonna, he's got so many things that I'm going to pick something that I think everyone will enjoy, and, and we'll get the word out to you on that. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, we're, you know, as our board is still fussing around trying to figure out how to do uh, our auction and banquet this year in an online situation. And the good news is we're starting to hone in on some things and we'll have more information in the newsletter and some uh, uh, different email posts. So uh, stay tuned for that. So now I'd, I'd like to welcome Callie Gallup. Um, Kelly, uh, Kelly is uh, like myself, uh, originally from Michigan. We both found our way to Montana. And uh, I don't know about you, Kelly, but I'm not heading back to Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> no, not in the near future. <laughs> not in the near future, that's right. And uh, um, although I, I learned to trout fish there, not fly fish, I had to wait till I came out west for that. But boy, when I came out here, I, I started with a passion and it's continued. But uh, um, uh, Kelly obviously has, has moved the needle on so many things in fly fishing, but and he's really known uh, you know, for having you know, a great shop at Slide In there on the Madison and all of his innovations in streamers, both in terms of technique and in terms of flies. So tonight, Kelly's gonna talk about really the four things that um, that keep many of us from catching the biggest fish in the river, and with a little bit of focus on um, on on streamers, of course. And you, just one more thing before I turn it over: at the bottom of your screen, if you put the, your cursor down there, you'll see uh, right in the middle it says chat. That's where you can ask questions. So, what if you have any questions of Kelly? Just do it in the chat. And then I will ask those questions at the end of uh, Kelly's presentation. So, Mark, if you feel if somebody you know you think there's a feel free to interrupt me. I don't you know if you think there's a really good question or whatever. Well, I'll probably have a good one, Kelly. <laughs> That's fine. You can do it right in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Bye -bye. We're on. Perfect. Welcome to my first Zoomer. This is a new technology for me. <laughs> I kind of, it's kind of fun. So, like Mark said, we're going to talk about the four things. Uh, I, I we, because these are new, we I kind of condensed down my normal programs, and uh, I've never done a program sitting on my eye butt before, and so without being able to jump up and down and scream. So, uh, I'm not sure how that's going to work. I'll probably end up jumping up and down, but. Uh, Kind of what I want to talk about. It's not necessarily all streamer. It's a lot. It's a lot about everything, but because I, I get asked the same questions over and over when I do my seminars and I and wherever I am, and so I had to do a really short one a couple years back, and I so I condensed it and I said, well, the guy said, well, why don't you just do something about how to all the good things? How about I? And I said, well, how about I do just about the bad things? And so that's how this kind of came up and. Uh, and so the, the, the fourth thing I came up with, and, I, and I'll go through them in sequence. And the first one is the river or the spot. And the second one will be the line, third will be your retrieve, and fourth will be your fly, which I find kind of funny that I put the fly fourth, considering I make a good portion of my living trying to convince you my flies are good. <laughs> and that's the cure-all to everything. And that was kind of the reason I came up with that because my the, put it at the end is that the most common question I get is what you know what's the secret fly I always get the person walks in the shop and says what's this 
what's the secret fly, you know, like there, and it, there isn't such a thing. But so I want to go through the spot first. And it's kind of reiteration if you've been to these seminars before, is that uh, I did a lot of diving before I wrote the first book. And when I started diving, ironically, it was, it was two things. One, I lived on the Great Lakes. And I was a, I'm a, a love get, uh, bass fishing in particular, but I'm a, I grew up gear fishing and then, you know, kind of worked into the fly fishing thing. And, and I started out doing that and I was just watching where the fish were in the lake to see how they responded. And then Gary LaFontaine's book came out and he had all this insight and all these crazy patterns. And I, and I thought, Honest, and I started diving the rivers mostly because I thought he was full of shit. I just thought he was a lunatic. And then I realized that he may have been the greatest mind ever. Uh, he is, and, and I started diving and I couldn't, I was trying to, I was trying to figure out if he was wrong. I was too young. I didn't want to just buy into everything. And, and I, I was, so I did a lot of diving. And so, but, I, and, it, and it was mostly for books. It was not like, you said you have Skip Morris coming in. Skip's a, he's a plethora of knowledge and, and he's a bug guy too, right? And, and so I started out doing that, but then I started di and I, I started to write this book and I started diving previous to that about two years, three years. And a lot of what I'm gonna go over has to do with when I say the spot or the river or wherever you are, it has to do with the things that you have to think differently about because if it doesn't matter what you fish, it doesn't matter if you throw a night crawler or a live minnow or a crankbait or a fly, if you throw it where fish are not, you're gonna have a hell of a hard time catching. It's just really hard to catch fish that aren't there. And so in my diving, and, I, and I'll, I'll go over the, I won't go deep into it, but uh, in the diving, what I found was that the fish it wasn't what I found, it was what I didn't find. The fish were not where I had been taught they were. And it was a really hard pill to swallow because I'd been a guide for 20 years. And so what I found was in kind of sequence, one, I never found a fish where I'd been taught. And so, but I would occasionally see these fish in very strange places. And so, as I was going along and watching this, you know, I'd be swimming along and all of a sudden I would be trying to take a shortcut. And that's how it really happened. If you want to know the truth, it wasn't by all of a sudden I decided, oh, I got to go over here and look. What happened was I had to, I was taking shortcuts to get through down the river quicker and I was taking the inside bends. And that's where the whole world changed for me. Uh, I started, and, and I, I've said this in other seminars, how this all started was I was doing a bass or watching a bass show and a guy named Larry Nixon was walking the dog, which is a topwater bait that goes back and forth on the surface. And so, and he, you know, he said something that would struck me as strange. He said, we use this when fish are set up in dower mean and temperature and push them down. And basically I thought that was kind of not what I've been taught my whole life that you go down to the fish. And I hear that related often with the other of people saying, you know, I gotta get deep into those big holes and all that stuff. You know, I get down to them. And so I went out and I tried, I was trying to do something in the middle of the day and I had a big stick bait that I tied up. It was a woolly scope and just a big, you know, like a five, six inch bait. And I was trying to walk it on the surface back and forth. And, uh, I got this giant fish, right? And it's long story short. And so I went back and I started diving and I dove that stretch of river again. And so I, and the, but I was pretty certain that I knew that river. I grew up on it. It's the birthplace of the Adams fly. It's called the Boardman. And I'd seen very few fish in it. Of course, I'm a guide, so I know everything. And, uh, you know, I'm just sure there's no 20 inch fish in this river. So I go down this thing. And the first thing I realize is I don't get, it was about 150 yards where I got the fish from where I started. And what I realized is I saw two fish that I really thought were bigger than anything. And they were only 18, 19 inch fish, but they were there. And then I saw my fish that I caught. And then I saw two more that were that size, roughly that size in the high twenties. 
And I basically went, oh my God, I don't know anything. And so that's how it kind of started. And so my diving back to that is that I would start taking these shortcuts to just go on the inside and I'll suddenly I see this big fish. And so I did a couple hundred hours of diving and started looking for these fish. And the thing I realized was that basically everything I'd ever been taught about big fish was wrong. And my, I mean, my dad was a guide in 1940 on the Pier Marquette and, and all I ever did was fish my whole life, you know, and I, think I had a date once, but uh, other than that, it was you know, just fishing. And so anyway, it's, it's about, about the where the fish are. And you have to get that through your mind before, before you can be successful, you have to stop duplicating. And that's one of the biggest things I see anglers do wrong. You know, you ask yourself if like, in, in my PowerPoints, I always, I have this drift boat going down the river and it shows a jet stream behind it, leaving red streaks. Right? If your boat left streaks down the river, you could do it by braille after a while because you'd see your boat goes to the same damn place every single time and you beat the same bank in the same hole in the same everything. And it's almost like, instead of saying, huh, something's wrong, you just think it's the fly or you think it's the day, you know, there's a million band-aids we put on our ego, you know, the barometer or whatever shit. And we come up with all kinds of stuff, but we don't really change what we do. I mean, I watch it every day, I, I mean, Thank God we don't erode the water because there'd be ditches down there that'd be four foot shallower from the boats going through and hitting the same spot. And probably the most important thing you can learn is just ask yourself, when's the last time you tried a different spot? And you know, you get in there and you're all excited and you beat the hell out of that run and nothing happens. Well, it's like I said in the very beginning, there's a very good likelihood you're throwing where the fish aren't. So the first thing that I learned through the diving and starting to just basically dedicate all my time to nothing but streamers. The first thing I found was, is that the fish weren't where I was fishing because I was always thinking depth and, and undercut and all this stuff. So in my diving, what I found, and then subsequently with all the fishing, is that the fish were seldom in water that would push them. In other words, if you stand in it and in any way, shape or form, it moves you around, it's too fast. These fish, you have to understand that all, matter of fact, almost all fish in the world, I don't care what it is, bluegill, perch, walleye, pike, trout, salmon, I don't care. They're almost all exclusively nocturnal feeders. Juvenile fish will feed in the day, but real fish become meat eaters, right? They become pretty much all, they're eating the neighbor's kids. They're just out there and they're, they're always looking for a big bite. And what we have to understand is if the fish becomes nocturnal and it has a daytime spot and a nighttime spot. We like to think that trout live in a spot their whole lives. And on a rare occasion, you'll see a fish in the same spot twice in a row, but it's pretty rare. In all my diving, I saw less than three fish in the same spot. Same, but the, the key is, is the same type of water. They're not in the same exact spot. They're in the same type of water. And so, and when I go back to what I said about it, if it pushes you. So you have to understand that the fish is a nocturnal feeder and it goes to a specific style of water at night to feed. And then it doesn't feed once they get above, and all, they're all different. It could be anywhere from 18 to 23, four inches when a fish starts becoming a real meat eater and is pretty much exclusive nocturnally eaten. And then, but it can happen at any, at any size. But what you'll find is the real fish, the big ones, and, and just let's call it 20 inches and above because first of all, a 20 inch fish is a great fish. We, we, we play it down like it's not a great fish. I hear people, oh, I got 324s. I'm like, oh shit, I wanna go fish where you're fishing <laughs> because that's a giant fish, right? And so, but you have to understand that they go to this type of water at night to feed and then they go downstream and they go to a resting area. And that's what I said when I started this, you know, finding these fish, taking the shortcut, instead of going on the outside of the bend, I would go on the inside and all of a sudden, boom, there'd be a fish. And so it's the hardest thing to get through your mind because 
when you look at insides and slack water, and my particular favorites, what most guides call frog water, which is the absolute best holding water for giant fish in the planet, and everybody rows through it, man. You just see people get on those oars, especially if you have weed beds, they row through it, and it, those are the incredible spots. But the first thing I would say you, know, you gotta do is you gotta stop fishing the same water you've done for the last five years <clears throat> and not caught a fish in it because you're just duplicating the same thing without going. And, and the other thing to that be always hitting bank. Nobody, you have to look for ledges. So the most important thing to me is to find <clears throat> parallel color changes. And if you can find them on the inside of a bend where you've got an, a color change can be depth, it can be sand to gravel, it can be all, anything. I mean, anything that makes a two-tone thing, a bottom, so when your substrate gets a two-tone to it, and if you can stand there and it doesn't push you around, that's the water that fish is gonna be in. They don't need structure, they don't need rocks, they don't need undercuts, they don't need trees, they just sit there. They have no natural enemy. They just sit there and they don't, and they rest. And we row our boats over them and throw to the other bank. And so if you can stop that, and it, it's hard to do, and, and I would, I, I've asked a lot of young guides this, when, try running the river 100% backwards of what you've ever done. So go down the river, if, you, if every time you get to this bank, you fish to the right side, fish to the left side, even if it looks like crap to you, because you really need to retrain your brain to stop fishing the exact same spot everybody else does in that same little juvenile 16 inch fish zones that keep your ego fed and move to that inside and start. But remember what I said about the push. If you stand there and it pushes you around like this, a real fish isn't gonna lay in that. It's gonna move to water because they're not programmed to sit there. They're programmed to basically rest during the daytime. And so they rest during the day and you can trigger that response. We'll get to that in a minute, the reactionary bite stuff. But that fish is really programmed to just sit there and not eat. It's just resting. It's waiting until night. And even the juvenile fish for, you know, that 18 to 22 zone, they'll tend to get on that stuff too. They're, they're starting to go back and forth, but they're there. So you really have to rethink, you know, these areas that are called resting areas. The other thing that you need to look at, as I see a lot of times, I, I, there's a pool on the Blackfoot. I always think you guys up there. I mean, and I've watched a, a dozen guides run this outside pool. You come into it, it's just a jammer, just slams you into this rock wall. And, and there's this water. And man, there's an inside on that thing that holds some of the biggest browns. Uh, I, I've never got a bully in there, but it's got a giant browns in there. And every boat goes to that outside and fights it. And they all throw the same thing. And you see them actually throw them back upstream because they miss it because they run they're, you through it so fast. And yet I never see anybody go to that inside. And so if you can recondition yourself, even give it just a handful. And then remember that the fish are seldom, I mean, it is really rare to find a fish in five foot of water. Big fish don't rest in really deep water. And it's, it's really hard. I just got on the phone today, I was talking to a guy in the White River and he said, man, it's blown out. I said, that's my favorite. I love when it's huge like that. And the first thing he said was, how do you get down to them? I said, I don't, they move up in the water just like they are. They aren't gonna stay deep. They don't like to be down there. You know, of all my diving, and I dove lots, as Mark said, that I'm from Michigan. And a lot of those runs are, we, we had some really big water. You get on the lower Manistee and the Asabo, and there's six, eight, 10 foot hole. I never found fish in them. I, I mean, five foot was really pushing it. They would, they're there to rest. There's no food down there. So there's no reason for them to feed. Is, you know, occasionally people say they go deep for the temperature. Hardly ever saw that either. And it's just, this is my observation. I don't, you know, and, and it bucks in the face of everything that we've been taught, but I seldom find a really big fish. And usually they're in three foot or less and virtually no current. They just don't like to fight big current. So when you get that down and you, and the other thing, and I, I, I wrote this when Greg Thomas was, and I were working on my uh, second streamer book, I, I never saw a giant fish in an undercut bank. And he wrote me back, are you out of your expletive mind? I said, no, I'm just telling you what I actually saw. I'm not making it up as I go. I never saw a giant fish under a cut bank. 20s, 22s, 
But even those, if you actually pay attention, you'll see that they're on the outside of it. They're, they're, here's the bank and they're right here, maybe out here, but they don't, I never saw them underneath. And I mean, we had tons of those in Michigan and I, I'd be under there looking and looking and the damn turtles and stuff are down there. Everything except big fish, but right under, right beside them, that's one thing. But, and we, we really pound the hell out of that with the streamer game. And, you know, when grass is hanging, that's a little different. That's a little bit different. I got a hopper bite, but for really big fish, and I mean real ones, I never found one under there. But yet, I, I see people just, they'll do anything to get a fly underneath there. And so what I want you to think about when you look at those runs, if the water pushes under it in any way, there won't be a big fish. If it somehow pushes the water against the bank in there, fish won't hold in it. They like to have water going straight down right over their head. So you'll, you'll see a lot of outside bends where people fish a ton and there's, there's just too much push. And again, just use the equation. If you could put a five-year-old in that water, it wouldn't tip them over, perfect. I wouldn't suggest you take a five-year-old if they're your own, it probably is okay. But just stand them there and see. If it, but when you stand there, if it moves you, you aren't gonna find big fish holding it. It's just something to consider. Because we, we really, when you go down and you, you, I'm thinking of one run on the big hole right now, things about a half mile long. I guarantee you, I have never seen someone fish the inside. My two biggest fish both came out within 100 feet of each other on that same inside bend. I see people pull in to take a leak or to picnic, right where I pull in to take a leak. It's where they picnic, strange. But they're right there. And then they get right back out and go to that outside. I've never seen an angler throw to the inside of this bank. And yet it's about a half mile long parallel color change. When they see people fishing it, they walk right out to that color change, which is about three foot deep. And they cast out into the fast water, but they never fish where the fish are. So the first thing is you have to get to where you're not fishing where you're not used to fishing. Get to where the fish are. And if we're looking specifically for big fish, but do it, you know, mid-sized fish too. They're all going to follow that. The next thing <clears throat> is unless there's a great question you've got right now, Mark. Anything you want me to that I missed or y'all good? You're muted. Okay. I'll keep moving. You good? <laughs> the Zoom thing's new to me. Uh, so, you're, you're muted, Mark. You there? Okay, I'll keep moving. I can't oh, okay. hear you. Okay, oh. now I'm here. Okay, so here's my question on, on, or that we got. Um, um, you know, on a river like the Bitterroot or the Blackfoot, sometimes there's just a parade of boats, or God, the Madison, no kidding. But the Madison is a little different because it's not pushing, you know, it's, it's, it's less distinct. You know, it's all that right careful water but on mm -hmm. uh, the big the the bitterroot the clark fork rock creek to some extent and the blackfoot certainly i mean those are those clearly defined big holes and big runs mm -hmm. that you talk about and that softer water everybody's drifting over that isn't that yeah. pushing the fish out when no. tenders go over they, they don't mind it they're used to it i mean <clears throat> i yeah i see fish in that water all the time after boats go and they are very distinct, you know, but it, what's, it, you're over there where they're all cast into, so they've got the same disturbance, so it's not that much of a difference. And those fish are pretty, too. And I missed something when, you, when I thought, of, as soon as you said, I was thinking about a run on the, on the uh, Rock Creek. And the, the other thing that I, I didn't really mention that is that I said the insides. It doesn't have to be an inside. It can be dead center. It can be right where those boats are running. All you have to do is have some sort of a ledge is beautiful, anything that holds, but just it's, it can be a boulder can create that behind it where you get that soft water. Boulder fields are one of my favorite. Uh, again, my favorite are, are weed beds. If I can find mid river weed beds that have parallel lines that go through them, that's absolutely money. And those are for sure the ones that all the boats run over. They'll, they'll or over them, they'll go backwards over them, but that is for sure quality water that we pass and like you said just throw beyond throw closer to the shore from the, where the boats are going but if in 
And the easiest way to think of that is, when's the last time you got a 25 inch fish out of this run? Well, I never have. How many times you fished it? 100. Well, what the hell do you think is going to happen 101? <laughs> I mean, the same thing. Try over here. Just break off from the normal and get to this water that's, because we, everyone can read the water that looks good, we think. But if you give it a dozen trips through there and you haven't cracked at least seen one, you need to change something. Right? You just, it's, you have to do something. Good? Okay, so now I'm going to move into lines because, and, and this is, this is somewhat specific to streamer fishing, but, uh, and there's a lot of, there's other things that could come involved here because, uh, like I said, I grew up as a, a gear fisherman as much as a fly fisherman. I, I absolutely love gear fishing. And, and the thing is, is that, we as anglers, as fly anglers, you know, a gear angler has, they can have floating lures, they can have shallow divers, lipless, lip crank baits, diving crank baits, you know, jointed, spinners, jigs, they have all these ways to go up and down in the water. And that's what basically the different lures are. They just have different zones that they go down to. We don't have that option. And it's still somewhat of a mystery to people about sinking lines or intermediate lines or floating lines. And there's a lot of thought process that are big, heavy, and they're getting the fly deep. So let's go backwards to what I said. I seldom fish, see fish deeper than three feet. I'll go down. I usually spend two, three, or four weeks on the White River, uh, <clears throat> which is one of the best. It's in Arkansas, one of the best big fish rivers in the world. And it, it's routinely, because when I go, I usually leave this uh, Sundays when I leave. And so it's routinely 15 to 20 feet higher than normal. And so it, you would think it would be a, a really hard river to fish, but the fish move over and they continue to stay in that three foot, three, four foot water, three generally. And so we have this conception in our mind that it's a misconception actually, that the sinking lines are going to get down deep. You know, I hear that every day, you're going to get down deep where the fish live. Well, they don't really get down deep. You don't have, and that it's, it's one of those misconceptions is that you really don't have time when you consider the fact that you're floating in the river, even if you're walking, you're still, you're throwing the fly out. You've got to start your retrieve. We'll get to that later. You got to throw it out, start your retrieve. River's pushing your fly. You aren't going to get this endless retrieve time, right? And so the lines become the diving bait or the heavy jig, but they become this thing that gets a fly in a specific zone. And this, and I, and again, I get asked this all the time about how deep and how this, I seldom, and I mean, I, I swear to you, I seldom fish deeper than two foot. I, I mean, and yet I use all these different lines because I have, there's, I have floating lines, I have two 250 grain lines, I have 280 shovel heads, 330 shovel heads. All of them do the same thing. Mostly they carry bigger flies, but mostly what they do is they get the fly down in different water speeds to the, the depth that I want the fly. And so a couple of things to consider that a fish never sits his belly on the bottom. They do not lay their bellies on the bottom. They're generally six inches off the bottom, maybe more. Sometimes in really big water, I see them, you know, three, four, five feet off, and they're hovering over an edge or kind of on their shelves. But mostly they're, I'm just going to say three to four, and they're six inches off the bottom. So that means you've got 30 inches of impact zone. So if your fly is 18 to two foot, that means you have this much where that fish has to hit it, right? It doesn't have to go through 10 foot of water. It's going to come, it's going to react to that fly. And so the, the lines, you have to get used to the fact that that's your mechanism to get your fly where you want it to be. And so, and, and I get asked, I mean, we sell tons of sinking lines. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And the question's always about, you know, can I put this one on this rod? And so the, that's the first thought process. Well, you know, that's important because you want to put a 280 grain head on a four weight, obviously. But the, the next thing I ask is, well, where are you going to fish? How, what river are you going to fish? How fast is the water? So if you're fishing, 
for example, if you're on the Ruby River or the Beaverhead River or Upper Clark for I mean, a lot of those you know, smaller rivers up high, the upper, uh, not, I mean, even though to some extent, the upper Blackfoot, a lot of the Missouri, uh, the, the current's not that heavy. The fish are not that deep. And so to have a 280 or 330 grain head in a water like that doesn't help you out at all. You know, you're going to go past your fish below them probably, lose a lot of lines, good for me, bad for you, because uh, they'll get down too fast. But it's not, it, it doesn't mean you can't fish a streamer with a floating line. I fish a lot of floating lines. And so it depends on the water. But you have to understand that fly line is what takes your fly where you want it to be. If you're on the Madison and you're going to fish cross stream, like uh, we'll get to that in a minute. When you get to the, you know, you're, you're fishing across stream, especially if you're on foot, that river's going past you like this, right? And so you may need a slightly heavier line to get you down there and to carry. And then you got to ask yourself, am I using a three inch fly or am I, you know, like a three inch sparkle minnow, right? Pretty much got a cone head. It sinks pretty quick. Doesn't need a lot of, it doesn't need a lot of help to get down, say, 18 inches. And that on this river, you never need to be more than 18 inches deep. So you could get away with a floating line, but the key is it, the sinking line will carry your fly easier than the floating line. Floating lines are designed to reduce energy, have your fly turn over nicely and land on the surface. That's all out the window with this. We like the fly to hit down, man. We want it to slap the water. It's it's that's that is the first impetus for the fish to chase you. We'll get to that in a second on the why it does what it does. But anyway, you go in there and so that line carries the fly easier. So if you're looking for all around lines and you stop thinking about fishing deep, and so because like the the line, the, my new lines are they're three, four years old. They're called shovel heads. And they're they're completely opposite. Actually when I sent the diagram to Tim, Ray Jeff, who uh, designed all our, my lines for airflow, and he said, you, and it says, and it's T14 at the front, which is really heavy line, right? So it's T14 for seven feet, and then it's 250 grain and 200. And he wrote me back immediately. He says, you mean you want this the other way around, right? I said, well, Tim, if I want it the other way around, I would have wrote it the other way around. And he goes, this is going to cast like shit. I said, no, it really doesn't cast easier than any line I've ever cast. But the tip goes down first. And so what I did that line for was actually big water, which I'm still fishing shallow, but I wanted my fly to get down to that zone quicker than it was the other with it going the other way. I see the line sinking with this big bow in them like this, and I wanted it to sink like that. I wanted it to go down first. And even in the description that he sent to Europe where they make our lines, he said, this is Kelly's new line. It'll probably cast like shit. And he put it in parentheses, <laughs> cast like a dream. But it's more line than you might want on certain rivers, right? Because, but on the other hand, you don't need it to get down. So when you start thinking about lines uh, more than just floating line, because a lot of people want to throw a floating line or a tip, like a, they, they want to pretend we're dry fly fishing. You got to get that out of your head. You just got to go with the line that gets your fly. And you'll probably need two lines. You need a floater. And you can always add weight to your line. It, like I used to fish the Jackson one fly line, and you can't use sinking lines. So I would put twist ons on my leaders in 16 inch increments. It's amazing how easy it casts and how it'll get that fly in that. And that's, that's the Snake River. That's big, lifty water, right? Really hard to get in. It's, a, it's the same thing. Fish are still in that, that same water depth, and they, that fly would be down 18 inches, and man, they would just come and get it on that thing and because and it's moving around i didn't need the sinking line i could get away because i had small flies i'm you couldn't fish bigger than a size six three x long i think is what it was might have been an eight it might have been a size eight so we got these little tiny flies right so i didn't really need i didn't really need that sinking line i could get down 18 inches with my twist ons on the leader and so it worked out pretty well so I just, I find it really important and I find it a little bit strange that we haven't figured out as, as a whole trout fisherman that the sinking line isn't 
your grandfather's sinking line lead course. They're really skinny, they sink very quickly, and they really make your casting a lot easier because they carry these flies that today. When I came up with the zoo cougar, that was like one of the first really big streamers, and it was a size four. And people would walk in, oh my God, what are you gonna fish with that? Pike, tarpon? I said, no, it's actually bigger than a tarpon fly, but, but they were this big. They're, you now have four of those hooked together to make a fly nowadays. I mean, we got people running flies this long. Uh, and so the fly line, so when you start seeing these bigger flies, if you're gonna throw them, it really makes it a lot easier for you to cast that fly with a, with a line that is heavier than your fly. And that's the whole dynamic of fly casting, you know? And so we, there's a little misconception that they're big, heavy, they're gonna drag the bottom, and so we'll get to that in the retrieves portions of this in a second. And so <clears throat> the, they, the, we think kind of like swinging a wet fly for steelhead. And that's not how we fish these flies. I mean, we, and you, anybody can do whatever they want, but if you, we don't really have to improve uh, the skagits and the teeny and the swing lines, they did fine how they were. Our lines are designed to come across stream and really fast active, you know, moving the flies. And so the line becomes, to me, more important than the rod and more important than the fly, because if I'm in the spot where I belong, I put the fly where it belongs, then I got a possibility of it reacting and I'm not fighting the system. So the line suddenly becomes the portion of your lure if you were gear fishing that takes your, your lure down to where it belongs. And so, but we play... We, I constantly hear people, well, can I get by with this? Well, yeah, you can. You can also golf with one club. But, you know, the lake people understand that two, three, four, I mean, fish with Gareth from Airflow, he has 14 rods with him, right? <laughs> They're freaks. They're like bass anglers. They've got just, <laughs> they've got rods everywhere and at least pouches of reels with lines on them because they really understand lake people are ahead of us in that and that they understand that they have to be in a specific depth, right? Because that's a different world. So number two is at least get one sinking line. And if in, in general practice in this zone, a 200, you know, don't get short tips. They, they won't, they cast, they don't cast as well as a 30 foot head. You know, my lines are, any of the lines, just try to keep them above 25 to 30 feet. And so that will, that's the that's the carrying portion of your line and that'll help you i have never once seen a person that doesn't cast a sinking line easier and more efficiently than they do a floating line because you instantly feel it on your back cast so good we're moving along got any question confused we have a question on the white river go for it and you can't the, come the with word, the word on the street is Kelly that you haven't done all that well on the White River over the over years. Last two years, not so good. <laughs> I got a bunch of twenty fives last year. I didn't get any. I think I'm still cursed from my ex girlfriend catching that thirty out from under me. <laughs> <laughs> probably a reason. Well, she <laughs> we had, had had two questions on the White River. One mm -hmm. is um, water temperature. Uh, and that would that would is, applies to Montana in a way too, in that the water temperature coming out of Bull Shoals is coming out at the same temperature all the time, isn't it? 365, 24 7. Yeah. 54 degrees, I think it is. But the temperature 59, is, I can't remember. Is below that, you know, it starts to fluctuate. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want rising temperatures, lower temperatures, or what is how does temperature affect the streamer bite on a river like the White? Well, the white doesn't really change. I don't care what it is, it, the temperature's the same. It doesn't, to see it fluctuate a couple of degrees is unheard of, but you always want to rise if you can. I mean, you always, cold water, to dry, they're cold water, you know, so they're going to be less active as they feel that constriction to, you know, conserve energy. So you always want a rising temperature to a, to a you know, <clears throat> till you hit 70 or so. Yeah. And of course that's going to be detrimental, but. Not necessarily for browns, rainbows a little bit, but not, you know, you gotta get into the mid seventies for browns to get crazy. But uh, down there, I fished that in every, you know, I started fishing the white in 1982 and 
I've seen every, and I used to only fish in December, and it was always cold, and but the water temperature's the same, same, same. So you get, you know, you gotta, you get downstream, closer to the North Fork and that stuff, it's, it, it changes because it warms up, but it takes, it's a big river and it takes a long time for it to get any heat to it. Yeah, good. And it's big, and unless it's really skinny. When they're running no water in the summer, uh, I mean, you can walk across that thing and you can't run a boat in it barely in, in a lot of times. And so that can get warmer then. Well, I, I was there for the first time with, uh, you know, some guys from Missoula here, mm -hmm. um, you know, last January and uh it's a big river oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it's I've hauling seen, ass i've seen it uh i've seen it fluctuate two years ago i think it was it went up 32 feet vertical Gee. rise unbelievable yeah. <laughs> so, so okay i think i was making the mistake that you just outlined in that i was getting way more of a belly in the line you know yeah. because, as you know and this is true around here too that you know, there was that soft water that was way up in the trees, and mm -hmm. that's probably where the fish were. Mm -hmm. And then there was that water that was just ripping. And, you know, so you get your fly in there and it would just get pulled away. Yeah. How do you deal with that? You get closer if you can. I mean, there's nothing, you can't beat physics. I mean, what are you gonna, if, you're, if your surface current uh, 20 feet from shore is going twice the speed of shore, it's physically impossible. You're not going to mend it out of it. You're you're right. going to get dragged out. You just run that. You, when you get a situation like that, you run very efficiently on the water you can. So in other words, you hit it. You may want to throw upstream instead of going straight across stream. And so you and you run very short windows of opportunity. You know, you might be running 10 or 15 foot of opportunity. It's better to do that efficiently than move to the next one than it is to just let it all swing out into that big water where those fish aren't going to be anyway. Yeah, it's just more more repetition. <clears throat> yeah, um, I got another question here, and that is, okay, you know, for our water here, you know, particularly the the Blackfoot or the Clark Fork, mm -hmm. what, if you're going to have one sinking line, which one should that be? I think on just as an overall, <clears throat> depending if if you're totally dedicated, for me it would probably be a 250, for my because I run seven weights. And, and uh, a, a 250 long or a 200, if you're, if you're on foot a lot, like I, I, I go down to a six weight and I run 200s on foot because I tend to be fishing pretty much straight upstream or much shorter casts. I want the rod to load easier. And so <clears throat> I, as a, for us, like all my guides, myself and here, we run a 250 on a seven weight probably 90% of the time. And that's a 30 foot tip. Yeah. But my, my lines are, you know, they, they go to intermediate behind them. So they're not floating lines behind them. But you, you generally, on the distance of your cast, it is generally less than 40 feet, no matter what. It's, it's difficult to throw control. It's one thing to throw a swing long cast. It's another thing to go cross stream, like you said, your line got out of control. When your line's out of control, your lures or your flies out of control. Once yeah. that happens, you weren't fishing, you're hoping. And so you control that, that line. We get to this retrieve thing, I'm gonna talk about that. But when you get control of it, you have control of your fly. And without it, you're just hoping the fly works. And so I, I would say, even on the white, it's rare for me to throw 40 feet. It truly is. I mean, <clears throat> I like to, it's, it's, it's kind of a mantra of mine, hunt more, cast less. Hunt your water, don't hope your water, you know? And so you get in big water and people start just hucking these things a mile out and hoping that on the way back, and they quit looking for those subtle buckets. The difference between great anglers and marginal anglers is their ability to tell you where the fish are. And so <clears throat> the whole thought process, we went through that for years where everything was cast, cast, cast. And, you know, you know, and I get it all the time. I have a lodge in the Bahamas. He goes, guys down there, well, you got to cast 80 feet. I said, I've never seen anybody cast 80 feet and, and see a bonefish, which way it's going. Or if you're up on the platform, it's one thing. But we get this, this idea of everything distance. And you get out with a really great angle and they'll be standing 20 feet from it and go, wow. And the same thing with streamers. You'll see 
people that are really good are really dissecting their water. We've already talked about that being the most important thing was your water. Number two is your line. And so it's the fish, it's your ability to read where the fish should be and put the fly where it belongs. And it's seldom do you have to be more than, I mean, 40 foot's a big cast. That, that's a big cast of control. I don't care what, I don't care what style of fishing you're doing. You know, it's a big, well, swinging's one thing, but I mean, if you're, if you're hitting spots and trying to actually hunt it, that's a, that's a long cast. Most of them are 25 feet, I'd say. Okay, 30, now. 30 maybe. Okay, well, okay, here's a, another question kind of along that line because it leads to long casts. What about, you know, more people are doing spay angling now? Mm -hmm. That's swing though. That's a completely different zoom. Uh, that's a completely different, I don't, I mean, I did tons of it when I was still at fishing a lot, but I don't ever tail first a fly of, of fly at a fish. I mean, period, end of discussion. It's not natural. Fish get caught on it, caught thousands of them. I swung, I started, I designed the first switch rod for Powell in 1984. I've got it in my, right over here. You know, people, it's a, it was just the first switch rod here. It was before, six years before Sage had a spay rod. And hmm. so, but it's not how we fish. I mean, you know, that's a passive, it, it, you know, if you think about the rod itself, longer, softer, it's a passive swing, which is great and it's fun. And it catches fish. It's just not as effective for doing what we do. For trying to, there, you're not trying to trigger a reaction. They're trying to present your fly as food. And yeah. so we're not doing that. What we're doing, and I'll get to that when we get in here, is about is creating reactionary bites because your fish aren't really there to eat. They're there to, you're trying to trigger them. Yeah, good. Okay. Ready? Yeah. You got another one? You're good? Okay. So the third thing I've got is retrieves. And I want to go over this because I think this is, once you know where the fish are, and that's good, and you got the right stuff. If you have, if you have one retrieve in your arsenal, you will have become a completely one trick pony. And so, and if all you can do is strip the line, you really are leaving a lot of fish on the table. It's just the way it is. And so, and I talked about the gear thing because the gear guys understand, gals understand that you can't have one retrieve for everything. And, I, and I've asked hundreds and hundreds of people this and they, you know, they say, well, I do just fine just stripping the fly. I said, that's great, you know, if you're happy with it. But does your crayfish in your river swim the same way that a darting rainbow trout does? Probably not. And do a sculpin swim the same way as a, it was a whitefish fry. No, nothing. So you really need to be able to mimic more than just pulling your line. So, and it's as simple as learn, and it's called the jerk strip. And I, and I encourage people to learn this. And, and I'm going to give you a little background. Just so there, I don't know how many of you all fish bass or, or like to gear fish or watch bass fishing shows. But the fly guys tend to think of the bass guys as bubbas. And, you know, people like Kevin Van Dam and the rest of them, they fish for about $20 million a year. And they're the best anglers in the world. And I mean, they are absolute machines on dissecting lakes. And it's, and it's if, you, if anyone could do it, it wouldn't be the same 10, 15 people winning all the time. And there's a guy named Shaw Grigsby. And he's, uh, Shaw is one of the legends in that sport. He's been around forever. He's in his 60s now. I mean, probably late 60s, still competing. And I was doing a seminar with him once. And, the, and he realized even back 20 years ago, these guys were making five, $10 million a year in winnings. And, it, and the, the best 15 in the business were always the best 15. And I asked him once, I said, Shaw, what is the difference between the top 15 and the million, literally, anglers? It starts in a tier thing. You have to win, win, win your way up to these, these big time tournaments. And if, if it was just throwing your damn lure out there like we do and pulling our string, everybody would be millionaires, right? Everybody would be winning, but yet it's the same 15 guys. And I said, what's the difference between the top 10 and the rest of the world? And he goes, without even blinking, we were walking down the hallway to get lunch. 
And he said, it's his ability to, to move his lure with his rod and not his reel. And I went, wow, that's the same with fly fishing. Because you are, as an angler, as a bass angler or whatever gear fishing, you can have reels that can retrieve when one turn of a hand of 40 inches of line. We don't have that luxury because we have to move the fly, right? And so <clears throat> as a fly angler, if all you can do is strip your line like this, the first thing you have to understand is that your ability to move the fly is simply that, tug and start and stop. You don't have the ability when you strip line like this, you don't have the ability on a cross stream cast to move your fly slow. You'll, you, when you try to go slow, all you'll do is pick up your slack, your fly will go dead on you. You have to watch your fly. The most important thing in all fly fishing is watching your fly. I don't care what you're doing. See the fly, make it do what you want it to do. When you learn to move your fly with your rod tip and not your stripping hand, you will suddenly have the ability to move your fly in little tiny movements, long snappy movements, but you will be cracking that fly and making it do something other than simply pulling on the line. So I'd like people to learn to do two retrieves if nothing else. And one would be to move the fly with the rod, right? So you, you, you throw the fly out, your rod's always low and downstream and you hit the rod and strip the excess. Just get to, so you can move your fly so it darts like this and you can also make it do that. And so that's really impossible to do. It's just simply pulling on your line. And so, and then you have to realize that not every fish is going to eat on the same retreat because not every, God help you if you go out and fish an eight inch deceiver the same way you fish a three inch crawfish. And so you should really understand. And when you learn to move your, your flies with your rod and not your stripping hand, and it's really hard to do. When you do that and you learn to do it, you can start moving. I like people to learn the jerk strip, which is a fast one. Everybody knows how to pull on the line. Everybody knows how to do this. Learn something different. Learn a new technique. I was a fighter for a long time. You wouldn't want to know one thing in the ring and only one thing. If somebody can teach you something else, don't fight it. Learn it, right? It's better for you. It's better for your nose. And so learn new technique. We don't do that as fishermen. We don't, we, we, we hardly ever even practice fishing. We go out and do the same damn thing over and over. And yet, you know, say, can you do this? Eh, I don't want to do that. Learn something new. Do something that, dis that stops you from doing the same thing over and over. Learn to jerk strip, learn to, and so you can, that way you can get your flies to zip and, and do different things. Because the thing about a trout and, and we already talked about where they are. The first impetus for that fish to come to your fly is not that eyeball you put in it, not that swinging little tail. It's that pow. They respond to Hertz wavelength. They are running for, they're coming to these things. Fish have the most incredible lateral line. Brown trout have the most sophisticated uh, lateral line in the world. 50 times more sensitive than anything we've ever developed for detecting, you know, it's the oldest fish in the world. It is, and it's just this super machine, right? They say that a fish can detect a 23 wavelength, which would be a distress light. When that, a distress wavelength is when it kind of distorts to your eye. When it goes like this and it's suddenly, and it hits it, they say that they can detect that 300 yards downstream. 300, 100 yards upstream. So here's this fish sitting there in that soft water and Bam, down goes your fly. That fish, and I want you to think about this because you all fish up in bull trout world. They're pretty damn sensitive too. They get this whole distress thing. And it's that, you know, that 17 to 23 wavelength where they feel it. And so the bull trout comes out of nowhere, right? Feels that distress. If you pay attention, if you got a little, especially if you snag a little rainbow or cutty, and you get them where they're doing that crazy, you know, you're nymphing or whatever. And all of a sudden this thing's just going crazy and running all over the place. If you stop watching that damn brook or rainbow, whatever it is, and look in a six foot peripheral zone of that, you will see a brown trout. They come that fast. They come looking, rather you see them. I mean, we get a 
does in a season where we're fishing little fish and you know got a little fish down and a brown eats it right and, and if you fish the blackfoot for god's sakes i mean you see it every day well that's the trigger that's your that's a triggering mechanism down goes that fly and you start to retrieve it so you go down you learn to snap that rod really quick and make that fly start moving immediately it has to move immediately the second because that's that fish that fish can go from zero to 34 and half his body length it can get there in an imperceivable amount of time. It so, can go so, 10 feet faster than you can see. Huh? Kelly, tell me, so I don't understand this jerk strip. How okay. do you? Okay. It's a hard one to, it's a hard one. Basically, your rod pulls, the, the, the rod's tight to the flies. When the fly hits the water, your rod's tight to it. You pull the rod tip, you know, you jerk it, and then you simply strip the excess. So it's just like you were, like you're trying to get it away really quick from the fish. So you snap the rod and strip the excess and that's how you fly. You don't strip the line, you pull the rod. You're pulling the rod back like your you know, elbow? You snap it with your wrist. Just oh. backhand it or uphand, whatever it is. But you hit it with your rod and you, you snap your rod, strip the excess. So it's jerk, you know, jerk the rod, strip the excess. Jerk the rod, strip the excess. Jerk strip, jerk strip, jerk strip. Don't say that at a party three times with two beers. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> so you're just, you're moving the, and I've got videos on it, there's a lot of, but basically what it does, it gives you the ability to move your fly slow because now you can move your fly. When you just try to strip your line to make your fly move, it just sits and drops. When you can move your rod and then instead of going sideways, you start picking your rod up and you start moving your flies like this. Now you've got a jerk, now you've got a jig retrieve. And I want everybody to learn to do a fast retrieve. You know, you can, you can strip line really fast. Anybody can, any monkey can strip line fast. Can you make your move, fly move slow and still make it swim, you know, horizontally through the water? Pretty hard because you're just, then it slows down, it starts to sink. You can do that with your rod tip. But now I want your fly to go up and down, up and down and jig it when you're cray fishing. So once, and it's the same thing, it's just now the rod's going up and down, but if you can learn to move your fly fast and slow, I guarantee you, you will immediately double your, it'll be, you just double your hookup. I was fishing the Missouri a couple weeks ago. It was perfect, it wasn't that really warm temperature was out, right? And it was a bluebird, perfect 70 degree day, like three weeks ago for, I don't know. And I was way down low there, you know, below, way below uh, the dams. And, and it just seemed like the perfect speed day. I had good water temps, I had everything. And I'm ripping that fly, man. And I'm running seven inch, just skater. And I'm just doing all these flies just, and I can't buy a damn fish, all right? I get one, three hours later, I haven't had to eat, nothing. I jig and get five in 40 minutes. All real big fish, big, real quality fish. Next day, I go out, repeat. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, you know, not real smart. Should have learned more movement with my head. But it's, it, I got same thing. It's been four hours. I start jigging, get three fish. Just like that. Fish, and I was trying to force the fish to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to fish really fast, right? And it was, seemed like the right days. But I started jigging crayfish and I started really, and really doggy drops on them. So they're just like lazy ass drops, picking them up and letting them drop really slow and absolutely annihilated them. You get up on the mo, any place you find weeds, any place and drop a crayfish down the side of one of those things, game over. They just come and run it, right? But you need to have two retrieves, at least if nothing else in your arsenal. If you can just learn to make your flies I have a fly called the flatliner and it's a surface bait, but it's, it goes about this far. And I crack that fly and I make it do these giant things and then I just let it sit there. And then I snap it with my rod tip and give it a little, so it's supposed to look like a dying rainbow trout, right? Or whatever trout's on the surface. And so that's a snappy, that's a big movement with your rod. So if you can learn to do these retrieves with, if you can get two retrieves out of your life, where you just got a fast one. Everybody knows how to do that. That's your moderate fast, right? Learn to snap it, but try to make your fly move in lots of undulation. Ideally, 
you're learning two six inch movements of foot. Get really good at it, you want four three inch movements. Watch your fly. If you learn nothing else tonight, learn to watch your fly. Watch the fly, and when you see it move, now make it do something different. Don't just sit there and say, hey, look at me, I made it do that. Well, make it go the other way, dumbass. Now do this. Now make it go back and forth. Make it do something. When you do that, you'll find it's always with your rod tip. How you achieve that, who, you know, who cares? But make it so you can make your fly move in lots of little movements. Anybody can move it in one big one. And again, I never ever, I, I, I wanna go over that. I don't swing my fly's tail first. I'm generally throwing a cross stream. We were just talking about that in the distance, 30 to 40 feet would be a long one. I'm gonna go cross stream. I'm gonna be looking for that thing I talked about in the very beginning. I'm gonna be looking for water three foot or less. I'm gonna be looking for a parallel color change. I'm gonna cross my fly. I'm gonna hit the fly down super hard when it hits the water. And I'm gonna move it immediately because if the fish has felt that, he's gonna be on it immediately. If he feels it and, you, and it sits there like a dead fish, doesn't move, I'll guarantee you that fish will make you instantly. So you're gonna trigger that response with the first time it hits the water, because you got a heavy, you know, you've got a fly on that's heavy enough to slap the water down. You got a fly line that carries it. You know where your fish are because now you're not hoping, you're hunting the fish. And then you're gonna make that thing take off and swim, reactionary bite. Now, that isn't working. Well, now what do I do? I beat the hell out of this horse and it's still dead. How about we try one more thing? Now we're gonna do the same. We already know where the water is. We know where the fish is supposed to be. We've got the right line. We're gonna go in and we're just simply gonna slow our retrieve down. Instead of doing a you know, horizontal thing that goes across the water wide open, now we're gonna do a semi-vertical thing where we go up and down. And we're gonna allow the fish two opportunities to feed, but you're not gonna be stuck as a one trick pony putting a goddamn bandaid on your ego at the end of the day saying, well, the fishing really sucked. You know, had I went up there the last time I was there and just thrown a one thing, I would have said that it was a really rotten day. I ended up getting over seven fish every day that were all big fish. And so and it was almost all of them. First fish was always on a fast retrieve. That was 10 o'clock in the morning, almost everything. After that, slow jig, slow jig. Piece of cake? Got to be a question there. Oh, and the one more thing. When I say I don't passively swing a fly, there's a reason for that because our retrieves are relatively quick and I'm hunting short sections of water, right? With a passive swing, with a, with a, a wet fly swing or a space swing or a trout space swing or whatever it is you're doing, you're just basically sweeping the water. So you're covering a lot of chunks of water, you know, if you're doing it right with a controlled speed and you're doing it through there and that's a food bite, right? Especially when your steelheads, talking about steelhead, they're squid eaters, they can eat things. But even then you can tell the difference between an aggressive eat and just one that eats it, you know, just sucks it in. But it's, it's a nice, but it's not reactionary and it's really not natural for a fish. And so they just don't back their asses in. I would say it in every seminar I've ever done. It's like a, a, a gazelle backing his ass into a lion's mouth. It just doesn't happen. They don't swim, they don't just all of a sudden swim backwards into, zones right not to say i haven't caught everybody's caught lots of fish doing it it's just the number of really big fish you catch doing it is really marginal compared to the people who go in reactionary biting and trying to trigger those responses i'll get a bunch of those guys on this so so uh kelly so how when you're fishing on this jig retrieve or you know the mm -hmm. up and down movement or sideways you know compared to swinging um is the bite different, the strike different? I mean, are they inhaling it or? Absolutely clobbering it. Absolutely smashing it. When it and it's saying, just like with a swing bite, when you get a swing bite and your rod just goes dead on you, you and then sometimes you get them that go like that. When they do that to you, when they bang and they hit the rod, that fish has hit you sideways. When a fish, when a line goes dead, and you can actually have that, I, that I mean, I was talking about my girlfriend catching that, my ex Mamie, when she got that big brown in the white, her her fish came straight at the boat, and her line went totally slack with a five and a half inch fly, and I saw her line go slack. Your line, that's impossible. Your line can't go slack unless something's pushing it. And I screamed, and she about she she, she almost went out. I mean, she she jumped so hard 
and she's got it, but it pushed it. That's really rare. It happens about once a year. And you got to really have your A game to see it happening, right? But, and I think you missed most of them, but these fish will come up. A, when you're fishing stream, it's almost always visual. You see almost every fish eat. I don't give a shit. I mean, it's just like, wham, here we come. And they can they come up wide open and they eat the head of the fly. They do not tail hit. They wow. eat the head of the fly and trout don't usually get an opportunity to eat their fish, that food on one bite. It's people think that they eat them. It's pretty rare. They go up, they bite them, shake them, let them go usually and eat them as they're floating back at them. They go down below, them. but they don't take something that long, bite it in the side. If you think the mechanism for that fish, he's got a hold of that. He's got a minnow like this sideways. What is his possible mechanism for swallowing? He doesn't have one. The water's pushing it backwards at him. He's gonna kill it, hold it, shake it, let it go, and he's gonna has to eat it head first. They have spiny dorsals on a lot of their food. Everything has something fighting them, taking it from the tail. And so most of these eats are very aggressive. Almost all of them are visual, and you know, away you go. It sounds like then you gotta hit them pretty hard. Most of the time, yeah, you hit them. It's pretty much a, it's a <laughs> foregone conclusion. You react, you, it scares the shit out of you. <laughs> I mean, it's the thing, you, you know, you're fishing for that visual. And it's rarely is it, it, rarely do you not see it happen. And if you don't, you'll feel it. Good, moving on. We still got time, right? All right, the last thing I'm gonna go into is the flies because I, I think it's, it's in some respects the least important thing and in other respects it's probably the most because but I think you can fish the, and I say this in my nymph videos all the time, my seminars about nymph fishing, and it and dries to a certain degree. You can fish the wrong fly right and catch fish, but it's hard to fish the right fly wrong and catch fish. Because things that don't offend the fish, it will mouth. Fish are tactile eaters, they, they mouth, especially in your nymph fishing. For, I mean, for God's sakes, the Pertagon has to have proved that. I mean, that's one of the most deadly nymphs in the world, but what the hell does it look like? Nothing and they mouth it, they touch it. With a streamer, the, in particular, I think that the flies uh, can be really, really important and they can be just absolutely stupid, not important. You can have flies, when they're on a reactionary bite, you, if it's big and shiny and moving fast, they'll eat it, right? They'll come up, they'll hit it a lot of times. If they're on a food bite where things are, things are settling down, get a low ceiling, <clears throat> Uh, and I missed something. <clears throat> when I talking about where the fish, I just thought about this. We were right at the beginning, I was talking about where the fish are. And I missed this thing about fish being nocturnal. The fish, fish go, they, they eat at night and they have this travel time. It's an hour pre dusk and dawn. They move at night to their feeding zones and they move back in the morning. They almost always go downstream from a feeding zone and they look for that soft water, right? And so there's that, that movement time where they're at, say an hour before dark and fish start moving, they're more active, right? And they start moving to the, to the feeding zones. When that feeding zone, that's critical too. That's usually pretty skinny water. It's where you'd stand to fish nymphs and dries, less than three foot. Ellie, sorry, my dog's barking at the plow going by. <clears throat> and so, anyway, and so when you've got your flies, if you've got a, it's one thing that we have to change. Hold on, Ellie, sorry about that. Get over here. And so anybody that's ever seen my videos knows, has heard that dog bark, inevitably, right? <laughs> so at any rate, they move in those, that, that time frame. And one thing that when you're fishing uh, in the daytime and you get a low ceiling where it sets in on deep on you, really cloudy, gets kind of darky, not gonna move through quick. That changes things. Because I always tell people, look for that soft water. When you get that, that fake nighttime, you might slide over into some of those riffle things that would normally hold mid marginal fish. Because the big fish will actually move into those looking if it's a mock night. They'll just kind of, they'll go start prowling around, prowling around and stuff. But anyway, so for the fly itself, I have a couple rules uh, and, I've, and I've, I've posted this and I've, I've, it's all over the place, but 
I think the, with the fly, color is the first thing you concern yourself with. You figure out the color of the fly first, and then you figure out the type of fly. And some of that, so you, you know, you go out, and a lot of that will have to do with the style of fishing you're doing. If you're going to be a speed angler, if you're going to go out and you're going to rip the flies, you're, you know, things will, you'll, they'll tell you as you go. And who figures that out quickest is the person that's most astute at what they're doing. And so I have this, this little formula and it's from guiding. And I, so I start, and it doesn't matter where you start, but I never hold a fly. Me personally, uh, a minute or two would be a long time. So I tell people five, I've told people as much as 10 that are lazy and don't want to change your flies. But uh, I mean, three to five minutes is an eternity with the same fly if you're, if you are fishing in water you know that holds fish. If you know there's fish in your water and you hold that fly for five minutes, you've probably wasted four. Because the fish in this river in particular, you could not float for two minutes and not have passed quite a few fish. You got three, 4,000 fish per mile you know where they are. They're pretty much condensed in certain areas. And so I do, I go through my routine very quickly. And so I change my flies. I'm gonna, I, I'll, I'll lengthen it out and say every three minutes. That, that, that's not true. Sometimes it's three casts. And so, and if I know, if I know for certain I should have moved a fish, there should be one in there, I will switch over. You'll get back to it quickly. And so here's how I do my formula. I start, if it's a dark day, I start dark. I always start with opaque colors. So I start, it's, let's pretend it's early and it's a dark day. It's a black, white, olive, tan, yellow, chartreuse, blue. Usually it's five colors and they go backwards. And any of those colors, and so if it's a bright day, or if it, I have a bad habit of starting with a white boogeyman in the morning. I like the way it looks and I can track it. It's easy for me to see. So let's say it's a bright day. So now it's simply white, black, tan, olive, yellow, chartreuse, blue, boom. I go through that very, very quickly. And what you'll find is that the color will be incredible. You'll get into all of a sudden, boom, they're on a color. And so maybe it's not your favorite fly though. And so I'll get to that, I'll get to that color they're responding not, maybe not quite the way I want them to, but they show themselves. And what I mean by respond, all they gotta do is show. All they do is woo, give you a drive-by, right? Woo, here I am. See that? Yeah, I saw it, okay. Now you know the color. And so then I might go from a feather wing to a hair wing or a sculpin to a darter or any one of a hundred things, right? But it gets, starts breaking the equation down. So I go through it and you know, every two or three minutes and then you get, finally get a color that they're on and just fish it and see what happens. If they're coming up and they're always just coming close, stick with the color and change the style of fly. But then go. So the first, but the first thing I do, no matter what, if they're coming up to a color and not responding, I change, and this is why it's so important to have more than one retrieve. If they're coming up to a color and they're, they're showing, they're giving you a drive by, but they're not committing, then you change your cadence. That's the very first thing you do. The very next cast, if you were going really fast, you slow it down. If you were going really slow, you speed it up. If they still do that, then you change your style of fly, but keep the color. You get, so you've done two things, and if it still doesn't work, you start that rotation all over again. But you get through it, and you get through it in a hurry. And if you get a bite, if a flies, if they're on one fly, and you know, it's really, really rare to get a two hour window where they stay on it. You'll get them and you, you'll, you'll get an all day bite. It's usually on a stable color like white or black. You know, it's basics. It's usually, if you get an all day bite, hallelujah. That's the greatest thing that ever happened. Go look for free beer and everlasting love. But it doesn't happen often. If you get a two hour window, that's pretty, that's pretty good. That's a good window. And if all of a sudden you've gone two hours, two hours and 15 minutes, you haven't had an eat in the last 15, 20 minutes, you wasted time. Don't let a fly go off for more than 15 minutes. Don't let it happen. If you're fishing water that you can go 15 minutes and the fish won't eat it, there's not enough fish. Go somewhere else. 
Change your fly. You're muted. So on um, like uh, the lower uh, Clark Fork, mm -hmm. there's there's some beautiful fish in there. Big. And there's, in my experience, they tend to kind of be potted up. So you can, but you have to find those pots. And um, so, I mean, I mean, you might be fishing a half a mile stretch and there's no fish there, but you're still in a river like that, you're still changing the flies around quite a bit? Well, if I, I would have to be, you know, those are cutties. And so that's a little different game there. And then you do, you know, fish will pot a little bit, but I would have a hard time believing I could go 30 minutes without seeing a fish. And so, and the fish tend to react to re what they're going to react to, regardless of where you are in the river, not because there's more here. I wouldn't want to fish a 30 minute stretch of river that didn't have a fish in it. Right. So I would immediately start trying to figure out what was wrong with that. I, I think there'd still be a fish there, but if I was certain that it was just abs, if I could see that there's just not a fish here, then I probably would say, I'd sit down and get to the fish. I yeah. mean, it, I mean, there's places on, on the white even where uh, you can go where it appears to be 30 minutes, 40 minutes without getting an eat, come back two hours later and go through and catch 10 fish out of it. Yeah. And so I would be really suspect of water that was that long dead. And, okay, well, but, but, and if I, but I would, yeah, I'd still change my flies trying to find out if I had a fly that was working, I'd stick with it if I was really sure it was the water. I mean, there's an exception to every rule on earth, but I mean, you know, they don't always do. These are just things that help you get to that bottom line quicker. Do you have a hypothesis why yellow works one day and white the next or changes? I mean. No, I used to have a, I used to have the, you know, kind of theory was that it was light refraction and, but it, you know, you can have identical days. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Can, you know, there's a million things, personality, maybe, I don't know. You know, some fish are more aggressive. I don't know. I mean, because I've had the, the, the how I came up with the color scheme is I was on the identical. It's with Chuck Sheely, Chuck and Nancy Sheely, my favorite customers in history. I guided them for 25 years, and and just incredible anglers. And Chuck had one of the best days I ever had. The next day we went out, and identical, absolutely to the barometric pressure is identical. The sky is identical. It's raining. It's 74 degrees. It's like the most perfect Michigan fishing day on earth. Day before, couldn't tell you how many fish. You know, big fish, fish over two foot, and you know, big ones. And and the next day we can't buy a fish, but I kept. And that's how I came up with this color theory. Actually, as I threw the fourth fly on the deck, pissed off, and I looked down, it looked like a gob of seaweed. It was because the day before it was all olive, and I had changed the same fly four times, but really I hadn't changed anything. It just different kind of flat, but still the same olive thing. I went to yellow and absolutely lit it up. Same time of day, everything was identical. So no, I don't really, uh, you know, barometric pressure is one that people really like. I don't think barometric pressure plays as much of a, it's not as big of a factor in streamer fishing in the respect that it's still a factor, but I think it has more to do with your ectoskeletons, your, your, aquatic life wanting to move through. It really affects aquatic life. Hmm. And so you, you reduce your bug activity, which it, it's all a circle of life. When the bugs aren't moving, the fish aren't moving. Yeah. You know, and so one triggers the next, but then the streamer bite, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many hundreds of days I have on rivers that I, I know so well and everything's identical and the next day can't do it. But on the flies, I don't, I don't think I missed anything other than the fact that I have, you know, I go through that, that color thing first, go through it. Uh, and you can sub colors like olive, you know, or, or tan can be brown and white can be gray. And, and it doesn't matter if you use that theory at all. All, if you notice, all it is, is I went from opaque to neutrals. And so I had white and black and then tan, and it opposite ends of the spectrum. And I'm just going, I'm making big changes is what I'm doing. I'm not looking to have a subtle change unless they're on that bug, you know? So if I, they're on a dark olive bug and I can't get them to keep commit, I might try a light olive bug. But when I'm actually looking for this, this equation, I'm making radical moves, white to black, can't get more 
radical. And in the, in the neutrals, you can't get more from tan to olive. And so I bounce big. What so, about, what about I, fly size? Do you fool with that? Yes, thing? absolutely. I mean, we have a big trend. I was just going to get to that, actually. That we have a big trend in our business right now. It's going away. It's people are coming to reality. And, you know, when I said when I started the Zoo Cougar, it was a three-inch fly, and people thought it was obscene. And so we've went up all the way into the 12, you know, 13 stuff now. And there's a couple things that, I, that I've gravitated backwards, and, and I was part of that, pushing that too. A couple things that make a big fly hard. One, you're the real. You are the one manipulating the fly. It's very hard to get a fly. And I told you how important I think that immediate impact is, right? And the fact that that fly swims immediately, because I think those fish feel that thing hit the water, are there within visual of that fly within a half a second. They're there and they decide yes or no. And a big fly has a hard time getting taken off. It has a hard time taking off swimming. You don't have a bait caster or a spinning reel that you can just burn right out of the gate. You got to catch up to it and get it moving. And I think that's part of it. And I also think that we just, they aren't quite as, they don't sell it. You know, they're not, they get close to it, but they don't sell it. For me personally, I've kind of went back. I'm in the three to seven range and, you know, seven, seven and a half, right at the edge of the, uh, the, the big side. And three is right there. On occasion, I'll run trailers smaller than that. But I, I just, but I, I and, and a lot of times, I was thinking about this this morning. I was tying up some this, this smaller muddler things, and they're just marabou muddlers, and they're three and a half inches long. And I, for there was a long period where I didn't fish them. So I'd look at them and just think, oh, there's just not enough fly there. Yeah. But we, we, I saw a trend six, eight years ago where I was, especially on the white, where everybody was throwing 10 inch flies, right? Everybody's, everything was getting just gigantic. And I was fishing with a guy down there and, and we, were, we were six hours in and he hadn't got an eat yet. He hadn't changed his fly. And I had six fish in the boat. You know, nothing big, nothing, nothing giant. And fish up to two foot maybe. But, and I asked him, are you ever gonna change that damn thing? And he says, uh, I don't buy into that. I said, so your theory is, he goes, I'm fishing for the one. I said, so your theory is the one's really one dumb son of a bitch, right? That's your theory. <laughs> I said, I said, I, I have six fish in the boat. I'm getting fish moved. You haven't had a move. I mean, maybe you should try something. And then, it, and then the light, and I'm going to give you one tip that I, I shared it with everybody. And it happened on this day. There's a cloudy day. And this day comes in. All of a sudden, the sky parts, and it's instant. And it's 5.30. And it's not even 5.30, it's 4.30. Because it, it was late January. And all of a sudden the bank turns yellow. When you get that long yellow light, you go to tan and you do it right now. I don't give a shit how good the fishing is, change to tan right now. And I said, and, he, and we were having this argument, right? And we're on, we're dragging, we're running drag line and we're floating. And I said, change to tan. And I, and I just got a really good fish. Actually, I just got my biggest fish of the day. And it turned to yellow and I, I pull in and I cut that fly off and he goes, what the hell are you doing? I said, go to tan, man, go to tan. This is perfect. And he goes, oh, you really buy into this shit, don't you? Boom, got another one. Land it, boom, get another one. And it was like, they're just clobbering this thing, right? And we're in the perfect water. We get to the bottom and he's just pissed off. He's like, God, I can't believe it. He's like, all right, I'm going to switch. I go, don't worry about it. Just the clouds came back and we had 30 minutes. Yeah, He goes, I'm sick of you. I'm sick of you. It was Dally. He's all pissed off. And I, I, I said, so we get to the top and we're going to, and it's getting dark. And he says, well, now what should I do? I said, go black. Or go olive, I mean. And he goes, ah, I'm not doing it. And I switched over and I got one. It's, it's on his, he's always showing the picture. It's a big one, right? And he goes, all right, I'm going to switch. It's too late. Go to black because <laughs> it was dark. And he just threw his stuff down. <laughs> but it's, you got to follow it. You just follow and I, I tend to follow my skylight, right? I follow the sky. As it's getting darker, I follow it. I follow it. Like maybe it's, it's a neutral light and it's kind of like, like, like four o'clock is around here now when it's cloudy, it's great. I follow that with a gray fly. And as it gets yellow out, I go to that tan color. 
And it, you know, it's just kind of, uh, everybody will find out what works for them. But what most people do is they start switching their fly up or they'll, they'll, they'll stick with it and they'll get them and they'll just say, screw it. Now nah, it's a perfectly good fly. They don't want it, tough, you know? And that's, you're just leaving fish in the water. That's all you're doing. And so I like to have on the seven inches and, and on the reactionary bugs, I tend to have my reactionary bugs bigger, flashier. Like, I don't like, I don't like flashing a fly always, right? And, and it, there's days on super bright days, I like a lot of flash. I like a lot of chartreuses, a lot of whites, a lot of bright yellows. If it dulls down, I'm gonna to go to the muted colors and less flash. I don't like, on dull days, I don't like a ton of flash in my flies. A little bit is one thing, but I don't wanna just boom, there it is because nothing in nature reflects light without sun. You know, even your minnows, they don't do the same refraction that they do if there's something on them. I mean, if you've ever swim in the water with them, you swim in a bright day and you see them go by, they're like little mirrors. You see them go by when there's no sun, you barely see them. It's, you know, it's just nature. Cool? So, and then on, this, on, on my smaller bugs, I tend to keep them kind of muted too. I tend to have flies under four inches tend to be earth tone flies that are more natural because they tend to be more sculpinish, more crayfishy. Uh, <clears throat> not always. And it, it depends a little bit where you are, what time of year, spring of the year, you got tons of rainbow fry coming down, you know, juvenile white fish, you, got, you know, young of the year, brown trout, which are, you know, two, three inches. And you just got a lot of that food source. And I tend to keep them, you know, in my smaller stuff, they just don't, other than fry, if I've got a big fry thing, that'll be bright. But I tend to keep them a little bit muted. I tend to fish a lot of sculpin. Do you, the small ones. Do you, how do you, um, the different retrieves, like the jerk retrieve or the more jigging retrieve, do you fish different flies with those retrieves? Or that's, you, a, that's a great question. Uh, uh, yeah, I tend to, I tend to fish other than for cutthroat because they're, they're, they're the dumbest fish on the planet when it comes to something dropping in their face. When you learn to jig, they, Cuddy can't say no to something dropping. He goes, oh. I go, <laughs> they love that soft drop on them. And then, it, and they don't, they'll eat bright stuff really well. But trout, brown trout, rainbows tend not to, and that, I mean, and, and if you fish a lot of Cuddy's, man, when you learn to jig them, they, Wow, they just are dumb for that drop. And browns can be too, but I tend to fish on a slower retrieve, almost always tends to be an earth tone fly. It's gonna be something natural. Uh, it, if in, in some of the top water, like when I run those, uh, that bank or that flat liner I was talking about, and that's a dying fish and I tend to move it. I hit my rod and I hit that fly in a three foot strip, it hits the water, I hit the water, I give it two seconds, and I jerk it as hard as I can into a three-foot strip, and it kicks and it glides. It's, it, it, there are things called glide baits, and they, it goes like this, and it, the current's catching it, and, it, and, it's, and it leave it for about a second, second and a half. I tighten my rod, pick my excess line up, and then I hit my rod twice and make it do a little twitch. And uh, fish, the trout will act like a, a, and that's a bright fly. You know, that's, those are flashy flies. Cause I'm trying to imitate, that's a different thing though. But if I'm jig fishing, I mean, when I'm jig fishing, I'm probably, oh man, 90% of the time I'm running a crayfish. <clears throat> it's the most underfished fly in, the, in our arsenal. People just don't fish crayfish enough. And they, they fish them just like they do their streamers, you know, ripping them. And it, it happens, crayfish very seldom dislodge themselves, but they, surely don't swim at 80 miles an hour across the surface. And so I tend to be on an earth tones. I mean, I do them in tans and browns and olives. And I mean, I tend to do that. And I, and I jig a lot of uh, sculpin patterns too. I mean, sculpin don't have an advanced swim bladder, so they don't really have the ability to come up and, and swim, you know, do this. So they get kind of cut loose. They're trying to get back to bottom. And so I do, I do that on the big hole a lot. Man, they, they're a sucker for that on the big hole. Um, someone asked a question, and you know, um, I'll put it in context a little bit. So the, the, the Madison from Ennis down to Ennis Lake, 
you know, it's where you, you can't, you can float it, but you can't fish from a boat. Right. So, so you're waiting. How, and there's, you know, there's all these places. Right. How, 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 how hard do you fish a spot before you move on? Uh, well, I fish, I try to fish it very thoroughly, but I don't beat a dead horse. I mean, it's, a fish is going to respond and I may, I may stand in one spot and change a fly color, uh, but it's pretty rare to do more than one. I give it, I mean, I give it my best effort and I, and I tend to fish upstream a lot, right? And so, and when I, when we were talking about the retrieves, I was saying how you go cross stream. And I don't, I don't think I really touched on that so much. So I'm gonna go straight across stream, rather I'm, if I'm floating or, and, and waiting, or I go about 15 degrees up and start my retrieve, which I would have done where you were in those trees. But I never fish it down and let its tail come across. So I, if, because the belly is gonna form in the middle of the line, right? And so it's always gonna keep, I want the fly's head coming straight across or downstream, not tail first because that fish is going to ambush. It's always coming up and going to try to hit it like that, right? It's going to bam, come up. And so on foot, I do, I'll, I'll do as much cross stream as I can. If I can get in the middle and go backwards, I will. But if I can't, like down there, there's a lot of island stretches and stuff. I'll yeah. fish upstream at them. And that becomes even more critical that you have line control, short casts. God help you trying to throw a fly upstream and you do it more than 20 feet. You just, you're, you're out of control. That fly's coming at you. you and if you're on the Missouri or something like that, it's one thing. But if, if you're down there, you just, you short, you fish casts that are really short, succinct, and you keep control of your line. Yeah. You just, I mean, you keep control. And I said that in the very beginning, watch your fly. You have to see your fly. You have to know that you have control over it. If a fly comes at you and does this floating, you're done. You don't have any control. You might as well be nymphing it. It would be the yeah. same thing. Yeah. And you, you know, and you can dead drift them too. There's, you can, there, there's a million ways to do it. This is, I'm just basically talking reactionary stuff here. But when you start jigging, you're full on food foot. That's a full on food thing because you're giving them something. And you, and, and when you, when you start jigging, you lift your rod about two foot. You never snap your rod. You lift the rod up and you strip the excess as it goes down and you watch your line. If you're in a boat, most of your eats, well, you'll see your fly line do that. Or you'll see a white flash underwater. You won't feel it because they eat it on the drop. Yeah. And when they're eating a crayfish, they, if, they, if you're lifting your rod and they eat it, hallelujah. I mean, it's an automatic. He's, he's got it. Mostly, yeah. you'll lift it and you'll let it drop. And you try to let the rod tip drop with the fly without slowing the fly's descent. Right? And so then you watch... You watch where you think your fly is and you'll see this look like a leaf turning over half the time. And man, you better jack him right now because he'll spit that thing out just as fast as he ate it. You know, it's, it's a, really fun. I mean, that's a really effective way to fish, but boy, it'll beat you up too, won't it? Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it mentally, cause you're just watching all the time, right? Yeah, well, physically too. Huh? Physically as well. Uh, yeah, I, I tend to fish pretty short, so I'm not casting too far out, right? So just because I lose control of my fly. Yeah. Let me see. We've got another question here. Okay, just talk a little. Okay, this. Okay, these. You, you mentioned the fish, you never find in them way underneath those undercut banks. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're hanging off a little bit. Um, so you're, I still you're, shoot. Not, you're not swinging through there. No, it's impossible to swing through. Well, I guess you could come from the shoreline into it. Yeah. I still fish the hell out of them. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. There's certain things that I, I, I mean, I don't pass any water. I fish a lot of midstream water. I, I mean, if I have an option to fish middle of the river and ledges, anything that gives me a ledge, I'm on it. You're on the Yellowstone on the Missouri. If you're only banging those banks, you're just, God, you're leaving fish. They sit right where those boats float over them, and you find those, especially the Yellowstone. Oh my God, they're just stacked in that middle. But, and on the Madison too, by the way. 
But when I see a cut bank, given that it's not hauling ass underneath it, then you're just wasting your, then you're just going to throw flies into trees. That's all you're doing. They, they just don't come out of it. I mean, everybody's had something happen. I mean, yeah. they happen. But if you want to put numbers up, you're not going to find them there. I'm still going to throw over there because if I can hit close to that bank and that fish is out three fi- inches, I don't give a shit. He's there. He's, he's going to eat it, right? But I just don't tend to... I, I, I do it a lot more with my hopper fishing than I do with my streamers. And, yeah. you know, and the hop, part of that's time of day to, or time of year, but I'm still going to hit the bank. I'm still going to hit the undercut. I'm not going to, I would love to be proved wrong. I just, Matt, well, actually one of my biggest fish came off of an undercut, but he was a foot off the shore and I could see him. I mean, he was right there. And it was, I mean, that was a 10 pound fish that just, he, he was, I, and I had, I said to the guy, I said, somebody should throw over there. And we had a great outside. No, nope, nobody threw. <laughs> I mean, he was right there. What about leaders? Leaders are simple. Uh, my jig leaders, well, it depends. My floating line leaders are usually 10 footers. And I start with, a, I don't re- do a lot of reductions and stuff like that because the flies are going to carry, I'll have a four foot of, 25 pound and then I'll go to 12. And, and if I'm using small flies, I'll, I might taper down to eight pound. I use Maxima green and everything. And so, but I do, I do 16 to 24 inch increments and I do twist ties of lead that look like matchsticks. And I twist those on for weight. They, they're incredibly efficient. They cast really well. They stay on. And so that's, but you know, that's on foot or, really skinny. I don't like sinking lines on skinny water, like spring creeks. I think there's a that vibration when the line hits the water. It, I think it messes with them. And I tend to fish floating lines on that water. Uh, on my sinking lines, it's just pretty as basic as it can be. It, it's, it's 12 inches of 20 pound butt section and two to three foot of 12 pound for the tippet. I sell, I seldom go. The only time I fish longer than an overall three foot leader is if I, and I mentioned it many times, and I'm going to say it again for anybody that cares. When you can fish a checkerboard, which when you have staggered weed beds and you get gaps between them, uh, anyone who's ever fished below Beaver Creek at Lando, that's one of the biggest weed beds you'll ever find and it's a checkerboard they're staggered if you're going to find a giant fish it's always in there lower jefferson uh parts of the big hole lots you know not not so many on the blackfoot some on the clark not so much but anytime you can see these weed beds they are major that's where fish go to just stop it's perfect they've got there's weeds around they seem to like that they don't like to burrow into them they like to be in the gaps and that's one of the few times the, the Wind River in uh, Wyoming. It's got some of the best weed beds in the world. And the, I'll fish a longer leader there. And I'll actually, and I do that at Lando too. I'll drop a, I'll have a four foot tippet and I use cougars or anything at floaty, nothing weighted. And I let the fly line go right through the weeds and the fly, the fly is just above it. There's something about flies crossing fish's heads and weeds that just pisses them off. I think they can feel it coming a ways out, but man, they're total ambushers. But that's the only time I'll go more than, generally speaking, it's, I go like that, it's two foot, two foot a tippet off of 12 inches of butt. And it's 20 pound to 12 pound. This is sort of a sacrilegious question, I guess. But on the Henry's Fork, on the railroad ranch, you're talking about weeds. There's lots. They love it. And oh, they I mean, love they, you know, later in the year, they mat up and all of this. I mean, and I mean, you know as well as I do, when those fish are on bugs, every fish in the river is up. Mm-hmm. The next day, there could be bugs and not a fish rises. You know, how do you fish streamers on the railroad ranch? Well, if you were for sac- pure sacrilegious reasons, you'd get in a boat and throw them across and you'd wipe that river out. <laughs> and, and there's certain people who are very famous down there who've told me that their best days have been throwing streamers from a boat in the railroad ranch. One of them caught 42 fish. 
all in the big world, all in the big size. One of the most famous guys there is. And they don't like to talk about it because they don't like people to do it. It's too deadly. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just kind of the unwritten rule. You don't run the ranch with a hopper and you don't run it from a boat and you don't run it with a streamer. <laughs> but they eat the living hell out of it. I mean, they, they come in, you know, and it's again, targeting your zone. So you're going through and you hit specific water and you fish really succinctly. You know, you don't, you can't just go anywhere. You've got to target it. And that, and that teaches people like that's a good example because if you can't break it down, you really, that's the thing you should learn first. That's why we put the wrong spot is the very first thing. You need to break your water down. You need to look for those parallel color changes. You need to look for ledges. The one thing I didn't mention were boulder fields. They're the greatest. Boulder fields, mid-river boulder fields are just, I used to say submerged boulders and some guy in Sacramento lifts his hand and goes, have you ever seen a floating boulder? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> but boulder fields, because they create multiple parallel color changes and they've got soft water behind them so you can stand behind a boulder but you can't stand to the edge of it. yeah and yeah. so you get just and they're just everything's perfect in the world right and so they're, they're it's great holding daytime holding water so and, and just a, a clarification somebody asks so as soon as that fly hits the water do you want to move it retrieve it or do you let yeah. it settle just a second no no, I, I don't, I like to, it's hard to let it set any time because once it hits, it's a, everything's moving for you. It's already going and you don't want to develop slack in that line. So you, if you're going cross stream, if, you, if you're if you talking a half a second, that's pretty, the fly's still doing this, right? Yeah. But I, I like, when that fly hits, I finish my rod forward and I always, I finish forward like, like this and I drop my arm. And as soon as my line goes forward, I drop my arm and I move my fly. And I, I mean, I want, I personally think the first foot and a half to two foot is the most critical part of the entire thing. I think they've made you, I think they've tracked you and they've said yes or no to you. And everybody who's fish streamers to any extent has had a fish which they swear to God ate the fly before it hit the water. Yeah. It hit the water. But the fish can, when you, when you realize that a brown trout can go 34 miles an hour and half his body length, right? There's only a few things that can accelerate like that. A crocodile, a grizzly bear, unfortunately, <laughs> can get half their body length at maximum acceleration. And so, and a brown, uh, and most fish. And so that fish, it's, it's imperceivable to see, the, the eye cannot conceive 34 miles an hour and four foot. I mean, it's just like, what, what was that? And not to mention, they're completely camouflaged, right? Yeah. And so they hit the water, and that fish is there. It is like, and it's either going to make you and say yes, or it's just going to let it go by. But if it sits, if it hits and just is a blob, your chance of triggering that, because no matter how good a fly Kelly thinks he made one day, it still doesn't look like shit compared to the real thing. I don't care. It's just, they're not even close. I mean, when you get it, break it right down, right? They're not. It's there. It's something that's kind of like, oh my God, what is that? And boom, I'm going to just kill it, right? And that's what you get. But it's that for, I think the first second and a half to two seconds is probably what draws most of your fish. And after that, it's just, sometimes they'll track you to the boat. I mean, you'll get those days and you're selling it really well. Your fly's swimming really well and your cast, your, your set's right, everything's right, your fly, and they make it and they're, they're just, and you'll know if, you, if you're doing a good job, they'll never track it unless it's just the dumbest fly in the world. Sometimes some of the dumbest shit like gets fouled up and they can't, I've seen them track those, like just twist it up in a ball. Yeah. They don't even know what the hell it is. But you'll see them track you way back and you'll see them doing that super, yeah. They're juiced up, right? But they've made you and say no. They do the same thing with lures. Do you, do you um, ever fish two streamers? Lots, tons. I don't fish two big streamers ever. I fish trailers. I fish uh, <clears throat> the smoke wagon, muddler minnows. Like I love to fish double 
Uh, smaller flies, almost always, I always put my trailer in behind the big fly. Uh, some people like to do it the other way around. They think they, the whole predatory thing, like another one's chasing it or something. I don't think fish have a brain like that, but um, it's just, you know, but I, I fish a ton of trailers. So, I mean, a ton of them. And they're usually a size six, you know, yeah. six is right in that zone. On a rare occasion, I'll fish double, in the mornings particularly, I'll fish double, uh, uh, if we have fry and stuff like that. I get on the big flats, the mow's good for that. Uh, there's certain stretches of the big hole where they get a lot of minnows and I'll get on those with a double. If it's not a fry or minnow situation where yeah. the, would you fish like a big fly, let's say a black big fly and then a, white small fly or would you mix up the colors or i usually hold on one second i have the old dog who has can you see the old dog he has to go out My bad, sorry. Bad things were about to happen if he didn't get outside. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't, very seldom will I throw, I, 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 the other thing I'll run those, and I run those two to three feet behind my big fly. I almost always run the small fly back and I contrast. Sometimes I don't want to go, like I'm on this olive bite, right? And I just, I got to, I said, I said, I never do something that's total BS. Everybody, you know, you get, you just get a feeling where you say, I say, I never go more than two minutes. Well, I might go 10 minutes with olive and try and maybe I don't think I've done well. Maybe I didn't fish my water well. I didn't read it well. And so, or in, in the fall, when I know something's happening, uh, like for example, about 10 years ago, I had, my best fall ever on the Madison. And I was fishing a smoke wagon behind anything. And they would come up and buzz my tower on the big fly, turn around and eat that smoke wagon. And I had, I had 28 fish in the big world, you know, in the big size that season, which is three times what I've ever done since. And almost everyone ate that smoke wagon and I've never had it happen like that again. <laughs> And it wouldn't matter what color fly I had on, they would just come up and it was, maybe it was me, maybe, I don't know what it was. I would, they would come up and look at it, but they wouldn't commit to it. They turn around and eat that little trailer, it was size six smoke wagon, green and white, you know, olive and white. And they would eat it like a nymph. They would just go turn and oh, just swallow it. And so I do that a lot. I mean, just, and, and if I, I'm sticking to a color, and I'll, I'll break, or I'll put a total flash fly, like the Prince Albert, which is Doug Pauline's. It's a giant lightning bug, soft tackle lightning bug. And it's a great trailer, same thing. Do you tie the, um, the trailer just off the bend of the hook? Off the, if you use an articulated fly, tie it off the front hook, not oh. the back hook. You'll get, one, you'll get less tangles, but two, you, you won't, you kind of wreck the action of your articulated fly when you tie another one off the rear end of it. It doesn't do a thing and you don't get tangles. It's amazing. Uh, like I said, two foot usually about, usually. Well, Kelly, we've been at this for almost two hours and man, I, I, could, I could go a lot longer, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, this has just been absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, You've uh, you've uh, hit me where it hurts on a number of things, mostly changing <laughs> color. God, I like that my white fly. I can see it. You know, I like I a white fly too. You know? <laughs> and God, I'm just so loath to change. But I, that, I, there's a whole bunch of things I learned that I'm going to put to work. Good job. And I this has been uh, fantastic. So thank you. And Good. I, I my wanna, pleasure. I want to tell everybody that we've recorded this. We will have a link to it on our website, and it will be on the West Slope chapter of Chartered Limited's uh, YouTube channel as well. So uh, I think this is one of those presentations that's, uh, you know, you can share with your buddies.
but you might want to take a, a look at it again because there's I've got three pages of notes and uh, I'm pretty excited <laughs> about it. So uh, great job, Kelly. Great. To, uh, thanks for speaking to our chapter and uh, hope to see you on the river. All right, buddy. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.